This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Today on the show, I have Dr. Jean-Philippe Bouchot. He is chairman of a multi-strategy quantitative hedge fund called Capital Fund Management. He's co-supervisor of the research team. He is a well-known authority in the field of econ physics and a co-author of Theory of Financial Risks and Derivative Pricing. He's a professor of École Polytechnique, where he teaches complex systems. He is a member of the European initiative called Crisis standing for the Complexity Research Initiative for Systemic Instabilities. And he holds a PhD in theoretical physics from École Normale Supérieure. I hope you enjoy this conversation. So I want you to elaborate on your physics background, but bring that into... This, this framework of classical economics. Classical economics, you know, the rationality of economic agents, the supposed rationality, the invisible hand, market efficiency. But for, for some reason, uh, the, the idea of empirical data often gets left out of the equation. And I think, and I've seen this with, with some other uh, traders that have had success, a physics background uh, is different. It, it allows you to maybe look at the world through a wider lens. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm surprised that you say all of this because that's, that's more or less what my usual message is and, and you've captured it all in a, in a few words. Yeah, it, it is true that, you know, I'm a physicist by training and, and physics is, of course, learning through doing experiments and, and you learn that theories are no good if they're not able to reproduce observations. And even if your theory is beautiful, if it it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit, and too bad, and you just have to throw it in the dustbin and, and start again. So, um, so I, as a physicist approaching fin- economics and finance back in the early 90s, that's what struck me most: is that there's it it is a philosophical aspect to the way economics and finance theories are built, very much axiomatic and, and imagining how the world could be or should be um, and and then you know developing the theories without much care about what's going on out there so I, I guess that for a while it was justified to do that because data was not so easy uh, to to access so the whole academic world has developed uh, without data in a sense and so people had to Maybe supplement the lack of data by uh, by axioms and by ways of thinking that that can happen too in physics actually. But uh, so perhaps I was fortunate enough to enter the field when data became uh, very easy to access and and you know when looking at data and trying to make sense of data uh, through a, a kind of vivid light on the, on the failures and drawbacks of efficient market theory and, and you know, Gaussian statistics, black holes, all this, uh, to me, uh, was uh, quite ap- ap- apparent that it was, um, it was not enough to understand the world. But, you know, you mentioned uh, black holes model. Uh, it's still in use. So e- even, even though that systematic underestimation of risk uh, is well known by people like yourself, uh, it's still in use. Yeah, I know. I've been ranting about that for <laughs> ages, and and uh, one problem is is you know students. You have to teach students something, and black holes is so easy to teach, and and it's so beautiful mathematically that that a lot of of people just resent the idea of having to put it all down and, and start again with something more messy. Uh, of course, the world is messy, and it's, it, being messy, it's much harder to, to, to teach, you know, to focus on the right things. And uh, by definition, you have to form your intuition on something else than mathematics. And I think that's why physics is good at that, because it, it gives you a, a lot of examples where you can 
put your hand in in the dirt and and, and try to you know push on on some button and see what happens. But I think the same should be more and more true with uh, economics and finance now through two channels. One is the availability of data and the possibility to make experiments on data uh, simulations. That is, and and with even without data, you can do simulations. You can in, invent worlds of you know, people trading according to certain rules or firms producing uh, according to certain rules and implement whatever rule of thumb or, or feature of the world that you think should be there and then just run the simulation and see what happens. And then what's very striking when you do that, uh, first it's fun because you kind of play God and second, very quickly you realize that some of the rules just don't work. They don't don't represent at all what is seen uh, out there, and others seem to capture something that's very close to reality. And and so my impression is that by training people more and more with this type of background, this type of experimental background, in a, in a strange sense, because experimenting with simulation is, is a strange notion, which actually even in physics it took a little time for people to accept that simulation was uh, a legitimate way to do science. Um, I, I don't know if you know Mark Buchanan. He's a science, science writer, and he wrote a few years back uh, something on, on numerical simulation, which I like a lot. So if you give me one minute, I'll, I'll find the, the exact um, uh, quotation, because I, uh, as I, sure. said, I think he's, he's uh, spotted, spotted it right uh, with his own well, okay, so I have it. Um, so Mark Buchanan, in uh, an article, op-ed, I think it was, of, in the New York, New York Times, just after the crisis in uh, October 2008, said the following, done properly, computer simulation represents a kind of telescope for the mind, multiplying human powers of analysis and insight, just as a telescope does our powers of vision. vision. With simulations, we can discover relationships that the unaided human mind, even with the human mind aided with the best mathematical analysis, would never grasp. And, and for me, you know, this is this is the essence of of what the physics way of doing things has has brought to the game. Just so people don't think that perhaps you're giving an interesting uh, marketing story about a physics background for your your trading firm. Your firm does not hire traders. Am, am I correct? Yeah, it only hires physicists. And, and you know, uh, okay, people can think that, but we've been saying the exact same thing since the mid-90s when we started. And I know for a fact, for two reasons. Well, first of all, because the everyday life of CFM is driven by data, is, is you know, banging our heads against data and trying to make sense of what we see and make models inspired by what we see. And the second thing, which shows that it's not, you know, pure marketing is that I think we're uh, very strange as a trading firm to have published something like a hundred scientific papers in the last 20 years, uh, all published in academic uh, journals, which shows that it's it's really in our DNA to consider science as as the right way to do things, if you want. Well, let's jump right into my primary reason for reaching out to you today, which was seeing your paper, which really didn't have any big fanfare, just kind of all of a sudden appeared in the internet ether and uh, two centuries of trend following. And I wonder if you might uh, lay out a scenario for how that paper came to be and then we can discuss some of the specifics inside it. Okay, so as I said, we've been publishing papers for, for 20 years now uh, and, and this particular paper was on the back of our mind for a long time. Uh, there are two reasons for it to appear right now. One may fall in, in what you call marketing, which is that we're launching, uh, we've been launching in, in January this year a fund called Institutional Systematic Diversified, and a part of that fund is based on long-term trend following. Uh, so it is true that we needed to give some support to why we're doing that. And the second thing is that we recently, in the course of the la very last few years, uh, had, access, have, uh, had access to 
much longer time series than we had in the past. And in Tadaka, we've been able to go back to uh, you know beginning of, of of the 19th century on uh, commodities and indices in terms of data. And so this allowed us to backtest uh, quite a number of ideas, and in particular, trend following. And in a sense, to our surprise, we realized uh, that uh, the strategy has been extremely consistent since, well, as long as we could go back in the past. And, and this seemed to us to be a very uh, interesting finding uh, on the year where the Nobel Prize is given to to Fama uh, and Schiller uh, and, and Hansen as well. But uh, this debate on, on the efficient market hypothesis, uh, on which I've been uh, pretty vocal myself in the last uh, 10 years, I think it's you know, it is ironic that uh, that it's given to to Fama, who's uh, still arguing that there's no bubble, there's no crashes, that uh, the market went down in 2008 in anticipation of of, of the crisis and not uh, the other way around, and that everything is you know is perfect and uh, and trend following momentum in general is something that efficient market theorists uh, have. Uh, a real difficulty to explain because that that's completely out of the framework. I mean, you, it's very hard to evoke some kind of risk premium that would be associated with uh, with trend following. So it has to mean that markets are not that efficient. There's a, a lot of other um, uh, clear uh, discrepancies between theories and, and and reality, but I think this one is is a very genuine and, and clear one which talks to everybody. I mean, if Look, just looking at uh, the um, trend on the on the on the long time scale is giving information on the future motion of the market, then it really means that all the inf all the public information is not included in the right in, in the price right now. So for me, it's it's both from an intellectual and commercial point of view, uh, a very interesting finding. I thought the the statement that jumped out at me was. And this is from your paper, quote, the existence of trends is one of the most statistically significant anomalies in financial markets, end quote. And that's a, that's a powerful statement. Well, you know, we've been looking at financial markets in the last 20 years, and it's very hard to find extremely significant statistical effects. You can find them on the high-frequency side, but then there's a lot of uh, murky things ar around high-frequency. First of all, you know, costs are, are tremendous uh, if you want to trade uh, at high frequency. So it's not clear that all the high frequency anomalies that have a strong statistical signature are, as economists would say, uh, very relevant from an economics point of view. On the other hand, these very slow trends uh, where a lot of money can pile in and has piled in is, is of course, much more um, mind boggling in a way, and also has to be uh, taken into account both for academics, but also for, from, uh, from the point of view of professionals. You know, a couple of the other interesting facts that I thought in the paper, perhaps this is obvious if data is going back to the 18, early 1800s, but trend predates trend following, which I thought was interesting. I think also, too, I think also too and I'll let you expand on that and expand on this, is the idea that it's actually a very small percentage of traders employing trend following models that make up the volume. So the idea of trend predating trend following and that actually the traders using these models today make up a very small percentage of the volume. Yeah, I agree. Well, you know, you can see it both ways. I, I would rather say that uh, actors systematically implementing trend clearly is posterior to, to the existence of trends. But I would say that traders on aggregate using trends is probably the reason why trends are there in the first place. And people using trends have been around for, for 200 years. And, and that's, that's my interpretation of what we see, is that there's a lot of people, of even small people, who on aggregate uh, play the role of, of trend followers and therefore create these trends. You know, it's interesting also, you mentioned Fama and the split Nobel Prize. I had a chance to speak with Harry Markowitz recently, who's very lucid. And uh, the the point that I made with Harry uh, was, you know, Harry, did you find it interesting that when you wrote back in the 1950s, this is what we should be doing, 
that within a few decades, other other academics had taken what you said we should be doing and had said, this is what we are doing. And his response was, well, I think you're going to have to talk to the behavioral economist about that. He didn't want to touch it. But his point being is that, you know, I never said this is what it is. This is what we should be doing. And other people interpreted it uh, to come up with these, uh, as, as you might say, these these hard axioms that became uh, rules, uh, the, the, the foundation of the efficient market hypothesis. Yeah, it, it is a strange field in the sense that there's clearly interaction between what people do and what people observe. And, and the use of Black Scholes in 1987 is not a vivid example of how things can go wrong when, when wrong models uh, are used. That, 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 that's what makes the subject fascinating also for a physicist because you have to go kind of one step further and try to uh, understand how the models themselves might, might change the, the game. So actually, we, we came up with a with a simple model uh, on how you know trend could lead to trend or mean reversion could mean, lead to mean reversion, and a priori both are equally possible. I mean, you know, that it's not clear that we could imagine a world where people would follow mean reversion rather than trends. Uh, but it seems that humans have such a propensity to follow trends. Uh, there's a lot of, of very interesting psychological experiments where you can show that uh, you know, when, a, when a small child sees three points aligning on a line, uh, it gives him pleasure. So, so there's clearly, we're, we're wired in to extrapolate uh, past trends, uh, and, and that's probably a way to you know, extrapolate the motion of a tiger jumping on us or something. That makes us uh, alive today. So, so my intuition is that it's 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 much harder uh, to go against the trend than it is to follow the trend. And again, there's a lot of very interesting uh, psychological or even biological experiments showing that there's a lot of things, hormones going in and out our our body uh, in the two situations: one when we're conforming to the crowd, and other the other when we're not conforming to the crowd. There, there's a there's a pain associated not not conforming to what's going on. Classical economics has no framework through which to understand wild markets, and wild is your phrasing. And I wonder if you could talk to the idea of classical economics not having the ability to have a framework to see those wild markets to see through them. But how do you how do you when you use the word wild? What does that mean to you? Yeah. Okay. So you're referring to a, a paper that I wrote in 2008 in Nature, uh, which was just after the unraveling of, of the crisis, and and this made me react very strongly because I I felt that this was you know in the cards, and and of course other people had seen it coming, but I was uh, not too happy with with the way economists had been uh, kind of dismissing all the attempts to to introduce a little more. Um, wildness in the uh, description of economic systems and financial markets. So actually, wild is is a reference to Mandelbrot. Mandelbrot has introduced uh, fractals. Of course, he's introduced also the idea of uh, distributions without uh, second moment, without variance, or infinite variance, or and distribution with infinite means. And and that's his classification of of randomness, if you want. So he would call uh, benign randomness, the one that economists love, Gaussians and, and things where the average, uh, where you can replace a heterogeneous system uh, with its average. And we know, for example, uh, this, this relates to the book of Piketty as well, that the, you know, the distribution of, of anything in economics is so broadly distributed that very often it just doesn't make sense at all to, to replace uh, a collection of people by by an average people by a representative agent would be the the classical uh, word. But coming back to Mandelbrot, uh, benign so benign randomness is is the one that I just described. Whereas wild randomness is the one that is difficult to tame, and it's difficult to tame because it's it's hard to speak about averages and variances. And so that's really what I was uh, referring to uh, when using the, the, the word wild. Now, why is economics in general not able to capture these uh, big swings? It's 
it's very strange. It's because the models are constructed to be intrinsically stable. It's like, you know, people insist on the fact that a rational world is a, is a stable world. And so your model should be stable. And, and so economics model come up with equilibrium points which are intrinsically stable. That is, if you perturb them by a small amount, they're going to naturally go back to the to equilibrium. And, and this is so much ingrained in the model that it's, by definition, impossible to have a crisis. And, and what's interesting is that when you remove a few of these rational assumptions and introduce market imperfections, then it's very easy to, to find situations where the, the rational equilibrium of economists, even if it still exists, is, is actually unstable. It's, it, and it's, it, it's perturbed by small external shocks in such a way that, that the system goes out of whack for a while, and this is what we would call a crisis. So I think that the mathematical apparatus is there to, to uh, allow us to not only uh, describe, but anticipate to some extent, or at least make space for crisis in, in the economic world. And for me, this is a, this is a fascinating re uh, topic of research uh, on which we've been focusing in the last uh, few years. You know, I'll leave you with this, but I think the fun thing talking to you is you sound like you're having fun with this subject. You have fun with, with what you do. You get to wake up every day and have fun. Yeah, exactly. That's, that, that's totally true, and I'm happy you say that. <laughs> There's not not much more to say, but you can just feel, I can feel it because it's 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 a big it's an it's an experiment to try and find empirical data to try and solve the puzzle to the best that you can, given that there's always going to be uncertainty. And I think what I have loved over the years talking to you, talking to you today, uh, many of your peers, is just that when you, when one accepts uncertainty, there's a certain honesty to it. And I think it, it's, it's, it's a lot of discomfort for me when, when people are so certain about what's going to happen. And so I, I just, I, I personally enjoy. But, but you know, I think that's, that, that's the, the big difference between uh, physicists and economists. And I think there's a lot to be written about this. And, I, you know, I, in a sense, I would say that we're privileged as physicists because we don't have to talk to politicians and we don't have to you know, make statements about how the world is supposed to work uh, in, in the sense that, you know, we, nobody's relying on us to, to make political decisions. And I think there's a huge amount of pressure on economists because they're under the spotlight. They, they have to come up with stories and decisions. And, and this means that it's not, it's very hard for them to take a step back and say, okay, I'm really going to try to understand what's going on here. And maybe it's going to take me 10 years or 20 years, but at the end of the day, we'll have a better theory for the world. And, and I've been said that by, very, by many people who said, okay, well, all this is great, but what am I going to say to my uh, Ministry of, of Finance when he asks me about uh, should I raise tax or should I do this or that? And it's true that it puts people in a bad situation because they can't think long term. And as you just said, as, as physicists by training, I think what we love is to, tr to be able to think that we understand something. And if we fail, well, it's okay. We, you know, we, it, it, there's nothing wrong in failing. It's, uh, we know that the f the physics has, been, has had so many revolutions and, and so many things that people were actually convinced were true turned out to be wrong in the end. So, it's a it's an incredibly good vaccine to against uh, what you said earlier about against certainty and, and and a certain form of arrogance as well. I guess to some degree you're expecting failure, and maybe maybe some of the some of the economists don't want to uh, they 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 can't, they can't acknowledge that there might be failure. Yeah, yeah, because the field is constructed completely differently for sociological reasons as well. Yeah. Hey, Jean, I appreciate you taking the time today. This was great, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And I, I think the audience will enjoy uh, listening to your insights, and hopefully we can chat again in the future as, as the wild. As Very happy to meet you someday. Of course, we've, 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 we've liked your book. As you saw, it's, it's actually referenced in our paper. And, um, and, and I'm very uh, happy to have been able to talk to you today. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. I appreciate it. It was good chatting. 
To find out more information, you can check out the Capital Fund Management website. Also, to see the trend following white paper we discussed, Two Centuries of Trend Following, Google will bring it right up. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.